In today's gospel, Luke presents the story of the Good Samaritan. It is particular to Luke only. It doesn't appear in any other of the gospel writers. And in it, Luke is presenting a choice for the people to make who hear it. Which one would you be in the story? Would you be the one who helped out the person on the side of the road? Or you would be the self-righteous ones, the Levites, a priest of the class, and a priest who walked by on the other side. But it's not just a question that helps people choose that which is good. There is something greater going on in the story. There's many ways to interpret, but one of the best ways I've heard someone interpret the story was Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict said, in the story, the Samaritan who's been victimized and is half dead is us. The one who comes and acts, the Samaritan who comes and acts on behalf of the person, the true neighbor in the story, is actually Christ. He is the one who heals our wounds. He's the one that cares for us. He's the one who restores us. And he's the one <clears throat> who cares for us. And ensures that we, through the sacraments, receive God's mercy as well as <clears throat> become people who give mercy. At the end of the story, we hear, you know, <clears throat> Jesus asked the scholar, who is neighbor? He says, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. We're called to be people who bring about God's mercy. Now, God's mercy isn't just compassion. It isn't just feeling pity for someone. Compa <clears throat> the word mercy from misericordia is to acknowledge from the heart true healing on all levels. Mercy is restoration. And we're called to restore the well-being, not just of ourselves through God's grace, but others. In light of the three-year Eucharistic revival that is taking place within the church, which is called to bring unity in light of the Eucharist, we are called to more fully look at the Eucharistic liturgy and understand its parts, understand its order, because it's all about doing God's mercy. From the beginning of the celebration, the priests and the ministers from the back of the church go up to the altar of God. In doing so, the priest, just speaking of myself, is constantly aware of what he's about to do. You see, when I was in the seminary, I was taught by my spiritual director and I was shocked one day when I was getting closer to ordination. He goes, uh, do me a favor. Why does the priest make this big giant sign of the cross at the beginning of mass? I didn't know. He goes, you don't know. I go, <laughs> just thought it was something we did. He goes, everything has meaning. Everything has purpose. Everything speaks of something greater. It's as if Jesus was teaching parables. He says, it's like this, but much greater. Well, everything that takes place in the Eucharist is pointing to something greater than just meets the eye. 
He told me, in no uncertain terms, he says, if you do not know what you're doing, you can bet your parishioners will not know either. Actually, he used a few terms that I left out in light of the company here. But uh, he shocked me. He was somebody very calm and mild-mannered, but he was frustrated by the fact that we're not seeing things more clearly. So, as the priest and the ministers enter from the back, they recalled of what was supposed to happen, that the priest acting in the person of Christ is going up to Calvary knowingly and wantingly to sacrifice for the atonement of sins. And so doing, he makes a conscious effort. As he processes up, the people stand not to welcome the priest. They stand because they're in unison with the intentions of the priest. That is, all of you stand in agreement that you too, even though not figuratively, but by your stance, are doing the same thing, that you've come to offer sacrifice for the atonement of sins in the world. That's why we stand. That's why we chant. The people <clears throat> would go up to Jerusalem. They would bring their cereal offerings to be sacrificed. And they go up with the first fruits of their sacrifice and place it before the Levites, the sons of Aaron, who in turn would offer a sacrifice at the altar of God so that their sins may be forgiven and their future harvests would be blessed. As the priest comes before the altar, he goes around the altar and venerates it. He kisses the altar. Does anybody have an idea why? Anybody ever think about it? There's a reason for it. The priest is consciously acknowledging that he's embracing the suffering and death of Christ and uniting heaven and earth. The altar represents Jesus himself. Also, when in the past altars were made primarily of stone, and within the stone would be placed a relic of one of the saints, right there at the very front of the altar. And acknowledging that, they, the priest would acknowledge the role of the saints in salvation history as well. It's called to show a unified church. The priest then goes to the presider's chair and makes that sign of the cross. He doesn't go. It's a profound cross because what he's called to think about and what he's trying to get other people to think about, that we are putting ourselves on the cross with Christ. Hence the big giant cross. It's in our minds thinking that we're there to offer sacrifice to bring about God's mercy. Then, the priest invites the people into what is referred to as the penitential rite. You know, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. All three times asking and begging for God's mercy, not only for our sins, but the sins of others. That's why we're called to pause ahead of time and think about the sins of the world and the sins of our own. Seeking God's mercy, not once, not twice, but three times. Knowing it's something that is definitely needed. In order for us to be truly healed. For we are preparing not only to suffer and die, but knowingly will be fed by Christ himself. It is at that moment that we then glorify God by proclaiming the Gloria. In that ancient hymn, whereby people contemplate God in heaven, Father and Son together, united with the Holy Spirit, the Son at his right side, interceding on behalf, we seek his willingness 
to bring us mercy, to listen to our prayers, and unite them with his gift of salvation. It isn't by accident we just go through these steps. The church has ordered these things through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In the Second Vatican Council, and Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Liturgy, it acknowledges that all the faithful are called to participate in conscious, active participation in the saving works of God's grace. We are called to be united, not just in posture, but in unity of thought, intention. We're called to acknowledge God totally in our minds and on our hearts and on our lips. It is something that we, as we hear in that second reading, that we should take to heart. Again, Ms. Akuryev, from the heart, we need to try to do something about the effects of sin in our world. Just as that <clears throat> victim, you know, on the way to Jericho was beaten and turned, we too are called to bring about healing on all levels of living. We're called to extend ourselves. If we take the time to understand our importance and why we're here, we don't come so we don't burn in hell. We come to Mass knowing that we can and do make a difference. And there's something we can do about what's going on out there in that world. Trust in the fact that God has chosen you and has chosen you with the people that you know who are in need of God's grace. You bring them here with us, not necessarily figuratively, that would be nice, but you bring them in your mind, in your hearts. So when those gifts are brought up, those names are united with God and he brings about the healing the forgiveness. It is God who is able to transform us. Allow yourselves to think of something greater. Try to see that something better is going on than meets the eye. Those things, examples I gave are just some examples. For the next few weeks, Father Dominic, myself, and Deacon Bob will be talking about the different parts of the Mass and why they have significance, why they have the ordering that they do. There's a method to the madness, so to speak. We need to appreciate each step within the sacred liturgy so that we can more fully participate. None of these are the absolute way to go about mass, but there's some things just to help you. I'm sure Father Dominic's examples were far different than mine this morning, but it's not about who's right or who's wrong, it's about getting people to think beyond what seems to be what's in front of us, to see that which is awesome, that which is God. For as we hear, God is not someone, as we hear in that first reading, someone who's far away, who can't be accessed except up into heaven, or can't be accessed by someone unless they go across the sea. No, God is here, he is close with us. When two or three are gathered in his name, he is present. And if we allow God to inspire us, we can do incredible things. His disciples didn't necessarily believe it at first, but when he sent them out, they did incredible things. They healed the deaf. They made the blind see. They helped the cripple walk. They were bearers of mercy. And that's what we're called to be. Don't sell yourself short. God has chosen all of us and gives us the ability in our day and our age to be healing and strength and be bearers of mercy. God is all merciful. 
He has been <clears throat> merciful to us. Are we showing mercy to others? Or are we a true neighbor? Or are we like the Levite or the priest in the story? Allow God to bring healing and peace not only to ourselves, but we in turn offer it to others. In this way, God's grace and mercy abounds and the world becomes united in one and in peace. God bless you all. And may further examples help you in celebrating this great gift from God, the Eucharist.